you know, I, I feel just a little uh, rattled, a little shaken, just because we didn't have church services on Wednesday. And, and so just kind of just even just being out of the pulpit just for that short period of time, it, it just feels like I still need to just kind of regather my thoughts and learn how to do this all over again. It's it's kind of it's kind of interesting there. But but good news is, is that we're getting more of it. We're getting more snow. So that's a blessing, right? Yep. 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 All right. Yeah. Didn't think so either. So. All right. So John chapter number 20 uh, is where we're going to be. Uh, we're going to begin reading in verse number one. So if you're there and you're physically able, let's all stand out of honor and respect for the reading of God's word here. John chapter 20, verse number one. <clears throat> A portion of scripture that many are familiar with, if not all of us are familiar with. And uh, we're really, we're coming down. We're, we're, we're about to wrap up the gospel of John here. Maybe maybe three or four more weeks, and then we'll be done. Uh, this is uh, sermon number 55. Uh, 55 weeks we've been in the Gospel of John. Does it feel like 55 weeks to you? Well, good. Three of you do. Don't, so that's good. So, All right, so verse number one. Here we go. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was dark, unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, let, let me pause right there. When, when the Bible says the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's referring to John. Th that's who it's talking about. Uh, every time when you see the disciple who Jesus loved, the author, it, it's, it's John. He's referring to himself here. He doesn't put his name in there, probably because he knows that this book is all about Jesus. And so he just refers to himself as the one whom Jesus loved. All right, let's continue reading. And saith unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple, that is again referring to John, and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying where the linen, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they saw, excuse me, for as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. All right, let's have a word of prayer real quick, and then uh, we'll get into the preaching. Father, we thank you. Lord, thank you for the music. Thankful, Lord, that we, we're part of a church family that lifts our voices and praises to your name. Lord, thankful for the special Lord, as you've allowed Miss Morgan to sing and you've allowed us to just witness it. Father, so, such great truth in that song. Lord, you're faithful. You're faithful in our time of grief. You're faithful in our time of glory. But regardless, you're always faithful. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to glean from your word here. And, Lord, we trust that you're faithful to meet with us. You're faithful to uh, speak to, to us through the word. So, Lord, I pray that you be with us now, Lord. Help me, dear God, to convey what your word says. Lord, your people didn't come to hear from a man. Your people came to hear from your spirit and from your word. So, Lord, I ask you that you would just allow me to just be a pipe, a voice box, an instrument, a conduit to just convey what your word is saying. We love you, Lord. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for Jesus. I pray you be with us now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> you know, we're really coming to a close in the Gospel of John. We, we really are. We're John chapter 20. Uh, I mean, there's only 21 chapters in this Gospel here. And and in John chapter 19, I, I want to say John chapter 19 was kind of a difficult uh, challenge in regards to studying the passage. Because let me just kind of rehash what John chapter 19 covered. 
I know, I know you've listened to it. I know you were here for it. But in John chapter 19, it covered some pretty uh, somber thoughts. It, it covered the fact that Jesus was scourged. It covered the fact that Jesus was buffeted. It covered the fact that uh, Jesus, he was brought before Pilate. And, and it covered the fact that Pilate could have done right, but instead of rather doing right, he'd rather uh, cater to the crowd, is what Pilate did. Uh, he, it, it covers the fact that uh, Pilate uh, presented Jesus to the people and said, what would you have me to do with him? And he, they said, crucify him, crucify him. That's what chapter 19 covers. Chapter 19 covers the fact when Jesus, he was publicly humiliated. He, was pu he would publicly carry his cross uh, throughout Jerusalem, where he carried his cross to Mount Calvary. It covers the fact where Jesus, he was, uh, uh, he was nailed to that cross, where his, his clothes was torn, and it was divided, and it was gambled over by the Romans. And then it, it also covers the fact that he, he uh, presented his mother to, to John. To, he says, mother, be, uh, woman, behold thy son. And basically he's saying, mama, he's going to take care of you when I'm gone. And, and then it also covers the fact that he died. And then after his death, it covers, John chapter 19, covers the fact that it was the man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. Remember him? Joseph of Arimathea, how he, he, he begged for the body of Jesus and that he would anoint the body of Jesus. He would take his body off the cross and, and also Nicodemus was with him. And Nicodemus, there they would anoint the body. And the Bible tells us that they brought about uh, spices about 100 pounds worth. That's a lot of ointment. That's a lot of spices. And they would examine the body. They would make sure that every splinter was removed from the body. They would make sure that uh, his body was removed from any object. They would pull the crown of thorns off of his brow. They would examine his back with the, the beating that it took there. They would examine the front of his body. And then they would wrap him in linen clothes. And then in John chapter 19, it ends with Jesus lying in a tomb dead. That's how John chapter 19 ends. Now, now church... Let's not be skeptical here. He wasn't in a coma. He was dead. The, uh, there was no brain function. He was dead. There was no blood flow going through his arteries. He was dead. There was no oxygen in his lungs. He was dead. The heart had quit beating. Jesus, his body. Now, now listen, I'm not trying to degrade the body of the Lord Jesus here. But listen, he was a corpse. No life at all whatsoever. That's how John 19 ends. But we should praise God for John 20. We should praise God and be thankful for John 20. Because John 20 takes place after three days of being in that tomb. Okay, so John chapter 20 begins with Mary Magdalene. And what she's doing is that she's going to come to the body of Jesus. But when she comes to see the body, she's going to discover... Uh, that the tomb ap appears to have been tampered with. All right, now look at verse number one. It says, For the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene, early when it was yet dark into the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. All right, now, now church, this is the same Mary. Th this is not the mother of Jesus. This is a different Mary. This is Mary Magdalene. This is the Mary who was possessed by demons. And Jesus had cast those demons out. And what we see here is that John, he is writing about or really highlighting her devotion and highlighting her love for the Lord Jesus. And we also know that in other gospel accounts that Mary wasn't the only woman going to the tomb. There was other women with Mary. Uh, and what we see here is that they had waited for the first day of the week while it was still early. Now, understand the reason why they didn't go the day prior is because it was Sabbath day. And they wanted to honor the Sabbath day. So, but here's the thing. The Bible says, early when it was yet dark. Some of you know what it's like to get up early while it's yet dark. Some of you have to get up, and some of you have to go to work, and some of you have to shovel snow, and you have to be there at a certain time. It's early while it was yet dark. Uh, listen, if, I, I don't think naturally you want to get up that early. Now, some of you naturally do just because you've been doing it for such a long period of time. But if it was up to you, you'd much rather sleep in. Hey, there's some honest people in church. That's good. So. But, but, but listen, it was early while it was yet dark. Mary Magdalene and these other women, they had a good reason for getting up early. 
They had a good reason. They wanted to show their love and they wanted to show their devotion. They wanted to make their way to the tomb that morning. And, and then this is what happened. Mary, she, when they make their way to the tomb, Mary assesses, assesses the situation. And unfortunately, she comes to a wrong conclusion. Because look at verse 1 and 2 again. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark into the sepulcher and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom John loved, that, or who Jesus loved, that's John, and saith unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher and we, we know not where they laid him. You see, she says we. Other ladies were with her. We know not where they laid him. Listen, Mary, she comes, to this, she comes to the tomb. She looks at the situation, and she jumps to a false conclusion in her mind. She says, they've taken the body. We don't know what they did with her. Now, the other gospels tell us that there was an angel that was on the scene and told the ladies some very good news. The angel said this, ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. Mary Magdalene missed out on that message. She missed out on that. What, had she had stuck around, she would have received the facts. Had she stuck around. But she assumed what the facts were based on what she saw. Hey, have we ever done that before? I mean, you, you look at a situation. You look at it from your perspective. And you think, look here, these are the facts because of what I see. These are the facts because of what I perceive to be true because of what I saw. But, but listen, we got to be careful with that because your perspective might not be the whole perspective. From, from what you see might not be the entire truth here. And, and, and so here's the thing. Uh, listen, this isn't part of the message. This isn't really has anything to do with the main part of the message. But listen, church, we got to be careful with what we say based on what we see. Because listen, that's how false rumors get started. And so here's Mary. And what does she do? She, she assesses the situation. She sees that the, the stone is rolled away. And she sees that the body is gone. And she goes there. She goes to Simon, Peter. And she goes to John. And he says, they've taken his body. But we don't know what they did with him. What, he, what, what they did with it. We have no idea. And what we see in verses 3 through 8. Now look at verse 3. It says, Peter therefore went forth and the other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together. And the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. So uh, John, John and Peter, they, they hear what was going on. And so what happens? Well, they sprint to the sepulcher. They sprint to the tomb. They're not too sure what's going on. Now, I can't imagine what's going on in their minds. Uh, uh, listen, can you imagine how hurtful it must be if someone that you love, someone desecrated their tombstone? Uh, that, that's hurtful. That, 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 that's, uh, that's low, is what that is. And, and so there, there, there's Peter and John, and, and, and they're, they're making, way, making their way to the scene there. And the Bible tells us that uh, John had outran Peter. Uh, Peter was slower than John. John, he was the first one on the scene. Now, look at verse number five. It says, And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went, went he not in. So, John arrives first. He's the first one on the scene. And the Bible tells us that he didn't go in, he looked in. Uh, now, I'll explain how this is important here in a little bit. So, he arrives at the scene. He's out of breath. And the Bible says he stooped down and he, and he looked in. Now, he's just visualizing what's inside. All right? Now, look at verse number 6. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie. All right? Now, let me have your attention here. I'm doing some explaining. What John did... And what Peter did were different things. There were two different things. Now, the Bible says that John saw the linen clothes. Now, the word saw means exactly how we interpret it. To see. To visualize. He, he, he looked in the tomb and he saw the linen clothes lie. He, he just seeing it with his eyeballs. The Bible says that Peter stooped in, or, or, or he stooped, or he walked in, he went inside, 
And the Bible says that Peter seeth. Now, if we're not careful, we can read over this passage here and think that saw and seeth are the same thing. We, we, can, we can just read over that and not think anything of it. Well, he just did the same thing that Peter did. No. John saw with his eyes the linen clothes. When Peter went in and seeth the clothes, that word seeth, it means this, to examine, to investigate, to, to look thoroughly at. Uh, okay, so when Peter went into the tomb, he was investigating the clothes. Hey, hey, can I, let me put it this way, okay? The linen clothes, they would be clues to reveal what happened to the body. Peter went in investigating. Peter went in examining. Okay, now, now look here. Garments... When, when someone would have been anointed with the amount of oils that maybe Jesus was anointed with. I mean, the, the Bible talks about Joseph and Nicodemus anointing him with 100 pounds of ointment. 100 pounds of spices. That's a lot. And, and so, and then what they would do, they would anoint the body and then they would wrap the body in these linen clothes. And typically what would happen is that in the, with the amount of ointment, it would begin to... The, the linen clothes would begin to absorb some of that ointment. And it would become hard. It would be almost like a cocoon. Everybody with me this morning? Okay. So it would be hard. It, it, would, be, it would take the shape of a body is what would take place there. And so there's Peter. And he's examining this scene. And he says, I see the linen clothes. It's like in the shape of a body. But there's no body inside. And then he says that he sees the napkin that would go over his head. And what has transpired here? Well, it's folded and set neatly next to the linen clothes. You know what the clues are saying? The clues are saying this. This was not a grave robbery. The clues are saying, why would somebody take the body and not take the linen? If someone's going to take the body, they would have to cut the linen because it would have been, uh, it would have taken the shape of a body. So, the, so listen, there, it seems like there's no malice there. It doesn't appear that there's any, uh, uh, like any much of a hurry to try to take the body away. It doesn't seem that there was any, uh, uh, oh, anybody would rob it. No, any vandalism taking place there. That's what I'm trying to say. No sign of haste. There's no sign of vandalism. Listen, the linen clothes were orderly. The napkin was folded orderly. And okay, now look at verse 8. Then went in also the other disciple, that's John, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. Verse 8 tells us that now John goes inside. Remember, John just peeked in at first. Now he's going inside, and this word saw very easy to just kind of read over and skip over. This is also another different Greek word from the first two words. This word means this, to understand, to perceive. Uh, have you ever had someone explain something to you that you didn't understand, and then you answer them like this? Oh, I see. Right? You don't see, you understand. So this is the scene. Mary Magdalene comes. They've taken the body. She jumped to conclusions. We don't, know, we don't know where they took him. Peter and John show up. John's the first one. He just looks in and he sees the situation. Peter goes in. He examines the situation. He investigates the situation. He said, and he's coming to this conclusion. There's no vandalism here. The, 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 the garments are still there. They're lying there. The, the napkin is folded next to the linen. N listen, this is not vandalism. The body was not taken. No, no, no. And then John comes in. And then he looked at the situation. And then the, this is what happened. The light bulb turned on. Ding! And John says this. I see. I understand what happened. Clues, the evidence is not saying the body was taken. Clues and evidence is saying the body came back to life. The clues and the evidence was saying the body was not robbed. No, the clues and the evidence says the body walked out all by himself. The Bible says then he believed. He believed what? The resurrection took place. 
that Jesus was alive once again. He comprehended what the, what the evidence was saying. Now listen, as we look at this passage, we see Mary Magdalene look at the scene and jump to false conclusions. We see the two disciples of Jesus looking at, at the situation, examining the situation, and finally coming to understand the truth. That the truth is this, Jesus lives again. That's what the evidence shows. That's what the evidence reveals. Jesus is alive again. But understand this. It wasn't, now listen, it wasn't until after the examining and investigating process took place that they believed. Did you catch that? It wasn't until after they looked at the tomb, went in the tomb, looked at the clothes, Notice it still had its form. Notice that the, the napkin was folded nicely. And then they believed. Now, why did they have to go through the examination process before they believed? Well, listen, church. Because their faith was based on what they saw, not based on what God said. Look at verse 9. Verse 9, 9 says this. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Okay, here, here's John and he's writing this. But now, now in verse number 9, it's like John, he stops the storytelling. Okay? He stops the narrative. And, and what he does, is he, he, it's like he's speaking of the account to his shame as to why they didn't believe in the resurrection before they examined the body or before they examined the tomb. And in verse 9, he says, For yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Okay, okay now, now l listen, church family. I've said this about two weeks ago, and, I, and I'm still sticking to this. Context is very, very important. Come on. Context is important. We just can't take God's word and say, well, this is just what it says, or this is just what it means to me, and therefore this is my truth and your truth, and yeah, whatever. No. Context is important. And the context as to when John wrote this gospel is, is, it is during a time where all the other apostles were dead. You remember that? I said this about two weeks ago. All the other apostles were dead. Um, Paul was dead. Peter was dead. Philip, Andrew, Thomas. All the other apostles were dead. All the other books of the Bible were already written. Matthew, Mark, and Luke were already written. The only books of the Bible that were not written were the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. All the other books were already written. And during that time of when Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written, listen, th that first generation of Christians, they took that truth of God's word and said, this is true. This is real. We believe this. But then all of a sudden, it's been about three generations later when John finally wrote his gospel. Everybody with me so far? And during that time of three generations later, there's a lot of heresy being taught. There's a lot of false doctrine being taught. There's a lot of blasphemy being taught. And you know what's going on? That blasphemy and that heresy, it might not have reached that first generation that believed Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But it might have had an effect on the second generation of Christians. And it had an effect on the third generation of Christians. And this third generation of Christians is saying this. Yeah, it, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the scriptures might have been good for grandpa's day. But listen, we're in this generation now. And this generation, come on now. Are we really going to believe something that we can't even see? Now look what John says in verse 9. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Now when we understand the context that John is writing to a generation. Now look, look here, look here. He's writing to a generation of young people. Third generations. Whose faith is being tested. Whose faith is being tried. Whose faith is, is, they're beginning to believe the heresies and the false doctrines of the world. Here is basically what John is saying. Hey, listen, there was a time where my faith wasn't where it should have been. There was a time where my faith, you know what I was putting my faith in? I was putting my faith in something that I could see. 
But what John, I believe, the spirit of what John is trying to say is this. I shouldn't put my faith in something that I should see. I should put my faith in what the scripture says. Verse 9, he, he, he's saying that he, they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Uh, I, I mean, throughout the ministry of Jesus, the disciples were constantly reminded by Jesus that, he was, that this was going to happen. They were constantly reminded that he was going to be betrayed. They were reminded that he was going to die. They were reminded that he was going to resurrect. But when it actually happened, they couldn't believe it. Uh, their, their lack of faith revealed that their faith, what, what it was based on, it was based on what they could see, not based on what God said. And, and, and I believe this applies to us this morning, ladies and gentlemen, that listen, your faith shouldn't be based on what you see. Your faith needs to be, should be based on what God's word says. Listen, just like in John's day, they were living in a day that was filled with uh, scripture being heavily scrutinized. We live in a day where scripture is heavily scrutinized. Wait, 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 listen, the, the, especially I understand that we are a church right now that is mainly compiled of senior saints. And praise God for senior saints. Praise God for your faithfulness. Because listen, without the faithfulness of the previous generation, we wouldn't be here. Come on, younger generation. This is where we say Amen. So praise God for the older generation. But, but, but listen, older generation, you need to pray for the younger generation because the younger generation is going through a time right now. There, there's a lot of scrutiny in saying this. You really believe those books of the Bible? You really believe those scriptures? You really believe that there was a snake that spoke and deceived People, you believe that? You really believe that there was a global flood and wiped out the dinosaurs? Don't you know it was a meteor that happened 65 million years ago? I was there, I saw it. <laughs> you really believe that stuff? You really believe that a man rose from the dead? You believe that stuff? Hey, listen. I praise God that I'm hearing people say, yeah, I believe that. I believe that. I believe that. But listen, what about the generation after you? What about the generation after you? What about the generation? That, listen, that, that's, that's paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to go, to go get a good education. Listen, I'm not, I'm not against having a good education. Listen, we need Christian lawyers and we need Christian doctors and we need Christian officers. We need, we need people in, in the workforce that have a strong faith. And we, we need Christians out there. Come on. We need Christian senators. We need Christian presidents. We, 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 need, we need believers. We certainly do. So, so listen, I'm not trying to bash having getting a good, good education, but I am saying this, I, I, nor do I want to be completely naive that, that, that in a college setting that there are professors out there that are critic, very, very critical to the Word of God. They are very, very critical to the Scriptures. And, and listen, we need to pray for the younger generation. You know what? I think the older generation... Well, well, let me encourage you to do this, older generation. Go to the younger generation and say this. Hey, listen, I know there's a lot of criticism about the word. I know there's a lot of criticism about the book. But listen, this, uh, I lived life a little bit longer than you. I've acquired a little bit of wisdom than you. And, and, and I've acquired more experience than you. But let me say this. You can believe the scriptures. They were just as good in my generation. And they're good in your generation. The scriptures are not a generational. They're not generational. Meaning this. It's not just good for grandpa's day. It's not just good for grandma's day or great grandma's day or great grandpa's day. It just wasn't good in their generation. No, this is what John was saying. Listen, listen I didn't believe the scriptures like I should have believed the scriptures. I was putting my faith in what I saw. Younger generation, don't put your faith in what you see. Because listen, it's like John is writing this to his shame. He's writing this to his shame. No, no, I didn't believe the scriptures like I should have. Listen, younger generation and older generation, don't put your faith in what you see. Put your faith in what God says. Listen, I'm sure that there's been times in our lives where our faith wasn't in the word like it should have been. Our faith wasn't in the word. Our faith is in what we saw. Our faith is in what we believe to be true. Based on our senses, based on our perception, we put our faith in what we thought was a good idea. 
hey, 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 older generation, you need to pray for the younger generation. Now, when it comes to finding a spouse, don't put your faith in what you see. Don't put your faith in what you see. Listen, don't put your faith in what you feel. When it comes to finding a spouse, put your faith in what God says. Because, listen, here, here's the thing. There's a lot of young people who even grew up in church, and a lot of young people who gone to Christian camps, a lot of young people who went to youth revivals and youth conferences and those types of things and sat under good preaching. But here's the thing. They saw a pretty girl. Or she saw a handsome fella. And what they did is they made decisions based on what they saw. That's dangerous. Come on. If you have kids or grandkids, that's dangerous. Don't put your faith in what you saw because, listen, I can't, I can't begin to imagine on how many times young people, they get into a relationship based on what they see. And, listen, there's a lot of shame that comes with it. There's a lot of shame. There's a lot of regret. There, there's a lot of, I, I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have given my heart away. I shouldn't have given my body away. And now I'm living with lifelong consequences. You know why? Because, listen, they're basing their faith of what they saw, what they believe would be a good potential spouse. He'll love me forever. She'll love me forever. Doesn't always play out that way. Hey, Listen, if, if you're single this morning, then here's the thing. There are some that shouldn't be prospects. Come on. There are some that should not be prospects. Don't base your relationship off what you see or how you feel. They make me feel good. He loves me. She loves me. No, no, no. Don't base your relationship on, on your senses. Base your relationship on what God's word says. Yeah. Hey, husbands and dads, God's called you to be the leader of your home. Come on, don't act like this is news. God's called you to be the leader of your home. But I wonder how many times a husband, a dad says, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take care of my family. I'm supposed to take care of my family. I, I, I want to make sure that they're secure. I want to make sure they're well taken care of. So, so this is what I'm going to do. I, I, I see that job over there. Now, and this is what it's going to do. Uh, that the grass is always greener on the other side. And, and I'm going I'm to take this job. And, and when I take this job, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to pull me away from church. And it's going to pull me away from my family. It's going to pull me away. But, but here's the thing. The benefits are great. The money is great. We have insurance. It, 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 the, the benefits are wonderful. Dental. I'm getting everything here. Hey, listen. I'm glad that the benefits are great. But you can lead your family to a shameful situation. When you're not basing your decisions off of what he said. And you're basing your decisions off of what you see. You can hurt your family. You can destroy your family. Your checkbook can be thick. Your bank account can be large. But is it really worth it when you pull your family away from God? When you pull your family away from church? When you pull your family away from serving the Lord? Is it really worth it? Let me tell you, it's not worth it. Because here's the thing. We tend to base our decisions off of what we see rather than what the word says. You know what? Older generation, I, again, I'm thankful for you. Praise God for you. But I think what the younger generation needs is the older generation coming alongside you, coming alongside them, putting their arm around them, and saying this, believe God's word. Believe his word. Believe his word of what it says about marriage. Believe his word about what, what it says about life. Believe his word about what it says about the gospel, most importantly. You know what God wants us to do? God wants us to believe, and then we'll see. Oh, okay, come on. Okay, listen. We believe in a Savior we never met. We've never met him. We believe in, uh, in, a, in his sacrifice that we never witnessed. We believe in his resurrection that we never witnessed. Now listen, there were witnesses. Over 500 saw the resurrected Jesus. We, we, 
we never witnessed it. Here's the thing. If we believe what his word says about the gospel, then listen, we believe first, and then we'll see the benefits of the gospel. Then we'll see, listen, then we'll see the benefits of what it's like to have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling inside you. Then you'll see, after you believe the gospel, after you believe first, then you'll see your eternal home. Then you'll see. Listen, what we often want to do is this. Let me see first, and then I'll believe. That's not faith. God's word doesn't call us to walk by sight. God's word calls us to walk by faith. And then when we walk by faith, listen, after we walk by faith first, then our faith will become sight. Yeah. So you can have strong faith this morning. You can have strong faith. You can have faith that proves itself true. You can have faith that proves itself the test of time. Well, how do you do that? Putting your faith in something that is timeless. Putting your faith in something that's been around long before you and will be around long after you. Church, if we're going to be a strong, faithful church, then our faith should not be, needs not be, based on what we see or how we feel, our faith must be in this. God's word. This is where our faith must be in. Listen, it was good enough for John's generation. It was good enough for his generation. He was trying to convey to the younger generation, it's good for my generation, it's good for your generation. And since it's a timeless book, if it was good for John's generation, it was good for that younger generation, and it was good, listen, it's good even in 2023. Still good. Church, where's your faith at? Are we basing our decisions based off what we see on how we feel? Listen, we're human. We're going to do that from time to time. We're going to do that. But here's what our faith should be based on. Not on what we see, not on what we perceive, based on what God's word says. And can I put it this way? John had what I think I think what John's trying to say in verse nine is that he's ashamed of his lack of faith. He, he was ashamed of his faith that it was based on his sight. Church, you don't have to have a shameful faith. You can have a strong faith. Not based on what you see, based on what the book says. Let's pray.